going to YouTube live streaming. There we go. Okay. And sound is off here. That way it won't travel. That's good. All right. So I'm going to pause live streaming here. I'm going to pause the recording of this meeting here. Let's pause the recording. All right. So everything should be set to go. I just need to get the headphones all set. Oh, look at that. It's backwards. That is what happens. Okay. Well, at least that's all set there. All right. All right, let's see what else I need to pair here. Is this moving on YouTube or is it not? Is there another version that's happening? That's the question. Hmm. What is this? Okay. I am live on YouTube. Version that's happening? That's the question. Okay. It's muted. That's good. All right. So let's minimize this, make this full screen. I'll get everything else set soon. set. Okay, cool. All right. So while I'm getting that all set and waiting, let's exit full screen, check our sound. Perfect. All right. I need to make sure that's closed. Good. 
YouTube is still streaming. This is good. Good. All right. That is all set there. All right. In a couple minutes, I will turn on the recording. Your potential self is infinite. All right, see if anybody's trying to get in. We don't need that song. All right. Okay. All right, let's make sure we have this available. Okay, and then we have our layers. All right, no one in the waiting room, I have about six minutes. All right, let's see if I can pull up. All right, if I pull up photos. Decent, but not what I'm looking for. All right, so what is it called on here? That's the question. Uh, we have recents. That's a good question. There we go. So if I put this down here and I, let's see, photos, I go here, what I can do is share screen. What am I sharing? I'm sharing photos. Okay, and then I can also Let's make this 
uh, big screen maybe. Okay, and then the next one is here. Great. Okay, great. All right, let's stop screen share for a moment and see who's here. All right. Okay, great. Hello, Amy. Welcome. Can you hear me? I see a still shot here. Amy, can you hear me? Just waiting for people to uh, file in here, one person at a time. Class starts in a couple minutes, so I'll be expecting hmm, five minutes or so after 8.15, people will keep coming. Oh, you don't hear me, interesting. Right, Anaga Monaghan. Anaka, welcome. Anaka, welcome. I, I I can't hear you yet. Uh, I see. Hello. Hello. <laughs> How are you, Anaka? Pretty good. <laughs> Oh, looks like Amy Tusio is here as well. Amy, can you hear me? Uh, I can't actually. I don't see video yet, but uh, I do hear you now. All right, let's let. Okay, Amy... great. Yeah, I'm having trouble working this out. <laughs> uh, no worries. We're gonna give a couple minutes for people to filter in before we get started here. No. Worries. Cool. A couple people to let in. Let's see. We have Amy Tusio. We have Kira Kroger. Scout Leader Wiley. All right. Hi, Amy. How are you? Hi. Hello, Kira. Hey, Scout. How's it going? Going to wait just oh, three to five minutes for everyone to filter in here. Uh, class is supposed to be starting about a minute ago, but you know, there are stragglers, it's how it goes. I have a bit of background to, uh, to share with everyone around what this class is about before we get started on the movement, um, which you can choose to participate in or not based on how you're feeling and what, what's going on in, in your space. Let's see. Before we get started here, does anyone have any questions while we're waiting for other people to filter in about, or perhaps what would you like to get out of this experience? Maybe you have a, a, an idea already. 
Do you have any expectations? I've mentioned some things about it being trauma informed. Uh, so helping us to self-regulate is gonna be a big part of this uh, through movement, mindful movement and breathing technique. Mm. Are there any specific things that you'd like to connect with? Like for example, low back pain. Uh, okay, so what in the world do I do with that? Um, anxiety, it's just st stress in general. Okay, getting a lot of head nods, cool. Uh, you're welcome to turn your microphones on. Uh, and if, there are, if there's feedback, then we'll turn them off again. But I'm gonna wait know. another minute or two, see who I filters wanna, in here. I wanna know uh, how to not uh, injure myself when I'm running on a regular basis. Cool, that's a good one. Yeah, especially running. Uh, usually it's done on hard surfaces. Um, usually it's done with um, high expectations. <laughs> yeah. I, I like, just can I stay consistent? It. Am I hitting this time? You know, am I going hard enough? Is my body doing what it's supposed to? Those well, and I just finished a challenge where I, I did a run every day for 75 days, straight, like basically straight. Wow. Did that work out well? Or are you, are you feeling I did, it, I did it and for the most part didn't hurt myself, but my ankle and my knee were like, I was having to be very, very careful, <laughs> very mindful <laughs> of, of my steps and everything. So, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing what you can learn when you're injured because when we're not feeling pain, we really have no idea that we could correct something that's out of alignment. Um, and often a lot of injuries that happen are a result of misalignment that's happening, high stress levels, combination of all of those things. And we just end up wearing something out because we didn't realize, oh man, I didn't even notice uh, that I was hurting myself until, you know, you turn your head suddenly and your neck's pulled, you know, something weird like that. Um, it didn't happen from just turning your head. It was a progressive thing. Looks like SL is waiting to join. Who's SL? Let's Hello. Well, out. oh, we're waiting for the audio to connect there. In my case with the running, I, I'm running on the, on the street and there is like, if you run in the center of the street, it's flat, but either side, it's slightly angled. And I realized mm -hmm. after a month of running on one side, my ankle was like tired and I had to switch to the other side of the street oh. so, that I could, so that I could compensate. And once I did that, it worked. Gotcha. Uh, I see SL with no video. Are you with us? Can you hear me? Hi. Hello. I'm welcome. Sage Hi. Sage. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, cool. Okay, I'm be, so it's, I'm, out. I'm I'm going to my dance class, so I might turn off video so you guys don't see me like spinning around. Okay, gotcha. Uh, just connecting with everyone, uh, asking if anyone has uh, anything that they would like to get out of the class. Any questions about it? Expectations? Scout? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I'm curious about uh, diaphragmatic pragmatic to diaphragmatic tension like mm -hmm. posture like a habitual sort of pot look rounded I, I notice I have an issue with with like rounding my shoulders forward and and cutting off my my air supply and when I try to correct my posture it doesn't actually really help with it with the breathing um, mm -hmm. and and then there's also like a holding of the breath that's non not really conscious or intentional so i'm curious yeah. about yeah some practices for for that um also like doing yoga and not tweaking my si joint because i've done that a couple times and it's not you're not really supposed to do that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. No. Um, yeah, the SI joint is really tricky um, oh. because uh, what you were speaking to, as far as the diaphragmatic breathing, um, and and the fact that it feels like you can't change it. Um, when our nervous system system is in a specific state, the breathing reflects that. So it needs to be shifted, and there are certain breathing techniques that help you to do that. Um, and so, it it the breathing techniques that we'll use will help facilitate that process. Oh. 
Dylan Smader is about to enter. Wonderful. And once he enters, Dylan, can you hear me? Oh, connecting to audio here. Um, when the di when the diaphragm is not able to move because of high stress in in the nervous system, uh, the the diaphragm is connected to the psoas. The psoas muscle is a muscle that tilts the hips. It flexes the hips, you know, lifting your knee, right? That's contracting your psoas muscle, tilting it forward and back, and also stabilizes when you're balancing on one leg. It does so many things in addition to carrying signals from the neurons in your gut to your autonomic nervous system uh, in your brainstem. So there's another technique that I teach called TRE, tension and trauma releasing exercises. And mm -hmm. it, the goal is to get the neurogenic tremor mechanism to be activated. That is a shaking that happens from the psoas, which releases tension that's held from high levels of stress and, and trauma that haven't been released in terms of body tension that we never processed, right? So think about what happens when we tuck our knees up toward our chest and we tilt our hips going into the fetal position, right? Mm -hmm. That's the psoas guiding us into a place where we protect our internal organs. And so it's, it's an automatic response to keep us safe. The problem comes up after we don't release that. And then the stress load continues to go up. And when we have higher levels of stress, our tension levels go up. When we have higher tension levels, our body goes, oh, I'm stressed. And it reinforces that loop. So <laughs> it's self-reinforcing, unfortunately. And the experience of your psoas being tight, it not only keeps you from moving your hips and, and, and whatnot, but it affects your posture in terms of the ability to just completely stand upright. So if your psoas contracts uh, to create a, a forward tilt this way, it's going to have you hunch forward a little bit. And the reverse can happen as well, but that's not as common. Um, and so your breathing, your nervous system state, and specifically your psoas, your center here, is what we're going to be focusing on uh, in the movements that we do. We'll get the nervous system to be awakened so we can let go of tension, start to become more aware of the layers of tension that we hadn't released yet, and then we'll start to teach the body to move in a way where it feels safe and we can relearn things. One of the reasons it's really difficult to learn uh, new movements and stay coordinated when you have uh, unresolved trauma in the body is because it's still in fight or flight or freeze or one of those high stress tension states. So until we shift that, we're basically fighting ourselves. Um, and, and it's not going to work out real well. Um, I wondered when I was a kid why it was so difficult for me to learn coordinated movements in sports. It's all I wanted to do. My dad was this amazing athlete and I want, I just wanted to be like him and I just couldn't. I, it just, everything didn't work. And so a lot of my journey has led me to understand how to correct those patterns and to do so in a way where along the way I discovered, oh, I have unresolved trauma too. You know, when you're in it, you don't necessarily realize that you have trauma. Um, and then I learned about the ACE scores and I'm a nine out of 10. That's, that's, that's up there. Um, and luckily I have, you know, high resilience score as well, you know, and, and you can find that on aces2high.com. But anyway, I wanted to share, oh, uh, is this a, a question in chat? BRB, be right back, got it. Okay, um, so I wanted to share the screen here just to get things started, unless anyone has any questions about what I just said. Nothing so far? Okay, so those of you who have seen my presentations will recognize this. I share this constantly. Um, so feel free to turn on your microphones because I can't actually see you. I just um, see this. Oh, there we go, now I can see you all. All right, so just raise your hand if you have a question. So this represents the stress in our nervous systems. The lowest level of this down in, uh, can you see my cursor on the screen? Excellent, okay, great. So safety, social engagement. This is what happens when we're calm. We are able to use our higher brain functions. We're able to integrate emotion with cognition and we're able to uh, feel our bodies. We're able to be present in this moment. Whereas when we start to go up the curve here, we go into the sympathetic mobilized, that is movement-based fight flight system. And that's to deal with whatever the threat is that we've perceived, okay? And so this I've correlated often with the patterns of anxious ambivalent attachment. 
So I believe everyone here is on attachment community. Um, and, and if you're not, I'm, I'm discussing concepts that you can just let go of. Um, but anyway, um, so when you go beyond that point of stress where you, can't, you, you haven't released it, where it gets to the point where it's more threatening. So this applies to both trauma and chronic stress. You pass this line here in terms of stress levels, you go into the immobilization zone. This is correlated with uh, the reptilian part of our nervous system, the part of us that goes into a freeze or collapse response. So this is more correlated with the lack of feeling and lack of movement. So it, it's not exact, but it correlates with a lot of the avoidant dismissive attachment patterns in terms of not feeling, in terms of not being able to connect with uh, awareness of our own body language and other people's body language and how to, as a result, stay socially engaged down here, right? Um, and if you notice here, this pink little line going above and below, this is what demonstrates what they call the PTSD cycle. And it doesn't mean you have PTSD per se, although it, this is one of the reasons I'm going back to school is I want to show this correlation between, for example, ADHD, what does that stand for? Attention deficit hyperactive hyperactivity disorder, right? And what are some of the traits of that experience? Uh, well, we're spaced out. That is an immobilization symptom. So that's above the line, right? And when we go into hyperactivity, that's our body trying to correct and lower the stress response. And so it's taking us back down into mobilization. That would be hyperactivity right? So spaced out, hyperactive, spaced out, hyperactive. That's a form in terms of the general patterns of the nervous system. That's a form of the PTSD cycle. So I see a direct correlation between the two. I still haven't found any research to validate it, but just so you know, what I'm describing are general patterns that are established in the nervous system. And a lot of what I'm doing is based on some pretty cutting edge research with, for example, Bessel van der Kolk. He talks about limbic body therapy, which limbic refers to the part of our brain and neurology that uh, is similar to mammals, right? Um, it's involved in emotion, in making meaning, in memory, and most importantly here, in attachment. We attach to one another with that part of our system. And when we are in self-regulated experience where, you know, we're, are, are, we're in a sense of uh, safety down here, either by ourselves or co-regulating with another person, we function way better. And so the insecure attachment patterns and the, I would say, disorganized or fearful avoidant is more like the PTSD cycle. Um, this is happening and there is tension in the body. In mobilization, we'll feel it. In immobilization, we will not feel it. So trying to taper off of these, these scientific concepts and go into, okay, what are, what, what are these for? Why am I talking about this? Um, we all have some degree of unconscious muscular tension in our bodies. And that's from unresolved, uh, could be trauma, could be just stress that we haven't released that day. It could be chronic stress, something that hasn't changed in our environment and it's gradually bringing us more and more up the curve. And it might show up as a mobilized symptom or an immobilized symptom. But ideally, we're able to move up and down the chart well. And when we get stuck in a particular zone or a particular pattern, that's when things don't work out so well. Uh, and so what we're doing in this class is we're addressing the concept of limbic body therapy. That's using the body, using breathing, sensation, and movement to retrain the body to go, I'm safe. I'm aware and I can move, I can choose to move. And you build skills around this and what the literature shows it, um, is that uh, Tai Chi or yoga or singing, theater, martial arts, a lot of different sports, whatever allows you to move, breathe and build skills is a form of limbic body therapy. So essentially what I'm trying to put together here, part of why I'm going back to school is to create uh, uh, a connection to the research around a specific technique that I'm, I've found works really well for me and all of my clients over the years. It's been 20 some years in the making and uh, I'm looking to expand that out to help other people. So our unconscious muscular tension that we don't know about, that we can't feel is up here, right? And the, what we need to do is we need to accomplish a shift in state 
so we can increase what I'll call a deeper layer of awareness. So we start to go down here and what will happen, we'll feel more of what was already there. So I'm gonna teach a breathing technique that you can use at any point during whatever we're doing to mobilize the system. That is to unfreeze a part of your body. And so we're gonna direct attention there. We're gonna move it, we're gonna use it and use a specific breathing pattern that helps with, with that. Um, I've incorporated some Wim Hof breathing and some stuff from yoga, some stuff from Tai Chi. And, and I don't use those terms, but that's where it all came from. So I wanted to show you one more chart here. Uh, let's see. Whoa, where are we here? Stop that. Okay, let me stop screen share until I find it. Um, goodness. In technology, we don't, we don't always mix. Here we go. Okay, let me make this uh, small enough so you can see it on the screen. Can you see the whole thing here? Okay, cool. So this is another important point, and this is why it uh, what we're doing is so powerful in terms of connecting it to regulating the nervous system, uh, changing uh, insecure attachment patterns by focusing in on the body with breathing sensation and movement. If you look at this chart, don't worry about all the details here. If you look at the top here, it, it's, it's, it says layers of memory and perception, right? So what we're looking at is what's going on when we are aware of something, right? So right now you're sitting in your chair and you're able to say, I am sitting in my chair. That is an example of explicit declarative memory. That is, I can put into words what I'm experiencing right now. You might even say, I feel a little bit more weight on my left butt cheek and I feel my breath is a little shallow. Because I'm personally, I'm in the middle of talking, so it's up here so I can project my voice and quickly change tone, right? So there are all sorts of things we can describe, but what's going on underneath that? So this whole top half is what's called explicit memory. That is, we're aware of it. And Everything down here is implicit, meaning we're not consciously aware of it in a direct way. So the next layer is what's called explicit episodic. So I can say, uh, I am sitting in my chair right now. And I can say it like, I'm sitting in my chair right now, or I'm sitting in my chair right now. And there are different messages being communicated, right? There's an emotional tone to it. And you might say the first one, I was excited right? You might be able to read that in my tone and my body language. Or the second one, you know, I'm sitting in my chair right now. You might say, oh, he, he might, might be feeling apathetic. And you can see my, even my posture changes. I'm sitting in my chair. I'm sitting in my chair. And they're the same words. But notice how complex it gets when we start to go deeper. There's an emotion behind what I'm saying. And so there's another thing being communicated. And this is where we get to the unconscious work that this whole class <laughs> is about. So at the implicit level, starting at what's called implicit emotional, what that means is not what we're consciously aware of. When I go, I'm sitting in my chair or I'm sitting in my chair, what I'm showing you with my body language is the emotion that's behind what I'm saying, right? So the words are up here that I'm saying because I can describe um, it. That's an in the class right now. Up here. And then I have the emotion behind it that's obvious that you could put a label to, but then there's what my body language does. And that you can read body language and you can go, huh, it looks like Mike is excited right now. Or it looks like Mike is a little bit down, right? That's the implicit emotional. It's what I'm showing with my body language and what happens in our behavioral patterns. We need to change that in order to get everything to work well. We need to show our body we're safe and it will show in our body language. We'll have upright posture, we'll be relaxed, not using any more energy than we need to and so on. Um, whereas where if I have a high level of stress, I might be holding my shoulders with a little bit more tension and I might, I might start to speak quickly and go, okay, check out this concept right here. You see that? And you can see how my, I'm getting a little bit mobilized, right? But there's tension involved. But deep down in the lowest layer of what's going on when I say, I am sitting in my chair, is what we're going to work on in this class. It's called implicit procedural memory. That means it's unconscious and it's in the body. I'll say it's largely unconscious because we can feel sensations and that's part of it. 
Uh, and within that, if you take a look down here, there are three layers of it. I promise you don't have to remember any of this, but the, if you have any questions about it, we can clarify why we're doing it. It makes it easier to remember the techniques. So the outermost layer here is learned motor action. I learned to ride a bike by getting some support from whoever, you know, held me up or maybe I had training wheels and I learned to pedal. I learned to steer and I learned to balance. So I have all those things going on and I need to learn those one step at a time. I need to feel safe and I need to uh, be able to practice and get success at the different steps in that process. So anything we do in our behavior, we need to change our learned motor action, which is this outermost layer of what's going on in the body, the way the neurons fire. Before I ride a bike, I might fall right over or I might be relying on the tra training wheels. Uh, but after I've learned that skill, the learned motor action patterns happen automatically. And I don't have to worry about that. Like they say, just like riding a bike, it happens automatically once you learn it. But how did that happen? Well, there are these two deeper layers of what's going on in the body called the emergency response, which is what I just described in the, in the polyvagal curve chart, that, that bell curve, looking at the different layers of, of tension there. If we're in safety, we can learn. If we're not, it doesn't work out so well, or it might be very difficult, uh, even if we do manage it, uh, because we're fighting against ourselves. But the basis of all of this is a sense of safety. It's called the fundamental organismic response. What that means is we're either attracted to a person or situation, or we're repulsed by it in a general sense. This is very binary. It's on or it's off. And when we're on, when we're going, oh, I like what's going on here. I'm interested. I want more. I'm curious, right? Perhaps you're feeling that way about this class, or perhaps you're feeling some level of repulsion. Like, uh, what if I make a fool of myself? <laughs> what if I don't understand? What if, it's, you know, these are all the things that are going on underneath. And what we're going to do is practice tiny steps along the way, making sure that we make it as interesting as we can, as simple as we can, so that we can go, okay, I tried that. This part didn't work. Okay, cool. Let's break it down into smaller steps. And my goal is to present it in a way that's simple enough where you won't have to ask me that. Uh, so we'll see if I've accomplished that at any point. Raise your hand or, or turn on your mic and let me know. Uh, so we can learn different ways of moving that are more secure functioning. That is, we're in safety. We're lower down on that polyvagal curve. And we're able to change from tension stress patterns of fight or flight or even freeze to more coherent, safe, smooth, aware patterns. Cool. A any questions before we uh, go into some of the techniques here? Good. All right, cool. So let's get this out of the way here. Remember before I was talking about uh, waking up unconscious muscular tension to bring us down the curve, to unfreeze us. Well, we want to activate the sympathetic nervous system. The next layer down from that immobilization response, we want to wake it up. We don't want to do it too intensely or we're going to end up getting our stress levels too high. So there are a couple different ways of doing that. The breathing techniques that I'm going to teach here are uh, both the Wim Hof technique, um, it's, it's one of his techniques, where you inhale as deeply as you can so your chest expands. You focus on the inhale as sharp and as deep as you can. <gasps> and then let it out. <gasps> now, if you do too many, you'll get lightheaded. If you are not challenging yourself, you might also get lightheaded. You need to stimulate your body so that it can use all that oxygen you're bringing in. Okay, so that's a technique that I will use once we're moving. And that's important to distinguish. If your heart rate's up and you're, you know, you're using your muscles and you're challenged, that's a great technique for re-oxygenating your system. I just have a, a question it. if I may interrupt. It's yes, in regards, yeah, if it's okay, it's in regards to breath work. So I have chronic anxiety so, or acute anxiety. And I've noticed that when I breathe um, or I try to manage or control breathing like the Wim Hof method, it has actually peaked an anxiety attack. So I'm wondering, um, where does that stem from? What am I doing in my body that is actually producing 
that emotion of anxiety when I'm actually trying to calm it down. It just, it's yes, going um, against. Yeah. I don't recommend Wim Hof if you have high anxiety. Um, I had the same experience. Um, yeah. Now, the way that I'll use this technique is very brief. So I was just training a client earlier today and he doesn't need as many deep inhales. As a matter of fact, he takes one or two and, and that's all he needs. And so you want to read your body, feel how it's responding. So I just did four breaths. I already feel a tingling sensation, a little bit of cool in my lungs, a little bit of warmth in my skin. You want to feel for changes in your sensations so you can read what's happening. Now, after we finish the sympathetic awakening breaths, we're going to go into the calming breaths. So just hang tight and, and I'll show you those. And you may want to focus on that more. So, yeah, um, so. did that answer your question? Yes, it did. Thank you. Okay, cool. You're welcome. Okay, cool. So uh, there, for example, there's a technique that I use to assist in stretching so that we can energize, activate the muscles, and then relax so that it can fully lengthen. And so we'll use that breath in the beginning to energize, you know, for example, sit and reach, right? Where your legs are out ahead of you, you're sitting flat on the floor. Here, why don't I just go ahead and show that. All right. So the, the Wim Hof breaths, <gasps> as many as I need. And then I'm gonna push all my air out and then I'm gonna go forward to feel for a hamstring stretch. So the first was energized to get oxygen there. And now I'm gonna use the muscle, I'm gonna activate it. I'm gonna pump in and out of the stretch pressing my heels into the ground, bending the knees a little bit, just slightly in and out. And once I feel the muscles are a little warmer, I'm gonna hold where I can relax and breathe deeply, which is the calming breath that I was about to get to, right? So we're, we're combining a bunch of things to first mobilize, to feel more, oxygenate the system, wake up sensation and feeling, and then relax, especially when you're stretching. You don't wanna be tense when you stretch. Um, whereas when you're doing an exercise and you're challenging yourself, you do want to mobilize your system a little bit more. So we have all these techniques that fit in specific uh, situations so that you can get more out of what you're doing, right? So we're gonna get the technique shortly, but I wanna make sure to cover the techniques individually first so that you know what I'm talking about when we go to it. Um, so another way to activate your sympathetic nervous system and wake up your system to go from immobilization to mobilization, to feel more, to get to a deeper layer of awareness is a technique where you, you can put your hand on your belly and practice this one. Uh, you want to pull your, your navel in toward your spine as you push air out and the focus is on the exhale. So uh, I can't remember what the yoga term is for this, but it's a, a maybe breath of fire. You push that belly in and expel the air. I'll, kind of like you're doing a spitball in elementary school, right? And you're going to pump that uh, a number of times to wake up the system. Um, so I encourage you to try these as I show you them, because then you'll feel what I'm talking about. So if anything ever feels uncomfortable, just stop. And if you need further support, just raise your hand and I'll help you. But let's try the Wim Hof, I call them the Wim Hof breaths, the deep inhale and relax. And just see how many it takes to feel a change in sensation, right? And And so we're focusing on the deep inhale and just letting it out comfortably. Notice any changes in your sensations. It should have awoken some changes there. Maybe it's temperature, maybe it's heat or cool. Maybe it's a sense of expansiveness or contracting somewhere. Maybe it's a sense of weight, like light or heavy. What do you notice in your body right now? Now, this is a skill learning to identify specific feelings and to label them. And especially when you put it into words, it's one thing to notice it and it's another to put it into words. And that helps to integrate the neurology into explicit memory, which is, is more integrated. If you can out loud describe what you are, what you're experiencing right now. Anyone want to jump in? What are you experiencing right now? Yes. Yeah. I feel confused. Like I feel like my body is pointing in like 20 different directions. 
Um, okay. Even though it's only pointing in one direction, actually. <laughs> so I don't know what that means. So say more about confused. Um, what's underneath that in terms of uh, how does confused feel in your body, the physical sensations? Um, I don't know. Maybe I'm just, maybe I was supposed to do more breaths because I still don't really feel like I feel my skin. I notice that my skin exists. Like I notice cool. that I have a body. That's like pretty much the only thing. <laughs> Whereas like before I was not aware of my body at all. Now I'm like, oh, I have one. That's pretty perfect. Much yeah. Yes, that's exactly what it is. Um, becoming aware of layers of awareness. So I, to give you some sense of uh, what to feel for and, and how the layers of awareness work, um, I find it's helpful to practice this one exercise. It's actually from TRE, where you take one thigh and just slide your fingers gently over it. And just notice what that feels like, to just feel the sensations of very lightly touching the skin. You might notice your breath doing something in particular. There's some pattern going on near breathing. You don't need to identify it exactly, but just notice what it feels like. And now what I'd like you to do, now that you have a sense of what that sliding of fingers along the skin feels like, now contrast that with tapping. Maybe you feel it a little deeper into the muscle, under the skin. Maybe you can describe in some way what that feels like. Uh, to me, I think of uh, choppy waves on the ocean. You don't have to use, you know, uh, actual descriptive words. You can use uh, metaphor. That's fine. People have said, ah, oh, my, my arms feel like cotton candy right now. Cool. That's a, that's a textured experience. And so you're noticing the difference between the sliding and the tapping. And now you can go even deeper by massaging a little bit and noticing, huh, what does that feel like? Do I feel it deeper? Is my breath changing? So deeper in terms of closer to the bone, the center of that leg. Uh, but you also might notice a deepening of awareness happening. That is sensations you didn't know were there are starting to wake up. And notice how gentle this is. We haven't even really done any work yet. And now actually contract the muscle. So I like to direct attention with my fingers spanning across the muscle here and just lift your knee. And notice the feeling of the muscle contracting to lift with this muscle here. Notice what that feels like, how that might feel different from sliding along your thigh, tapping or massaging. These are all different layers. You can make it more intense by extending the knee and feel the quad muscle working a little bit harder. This produces a deeper layer of sensation and you don't wanna overwork. So if you feel any burning going on, just relax it, shake it out. Even if you don't feel burning yet, you can shake it out and relax it. Now this next part is really cool. I'm not gonna tell you what's gonna happen. I want you to experience it for yourself. So take notice of what you're feeling in that thigh you were just stimulating, okay? Just notice it and notice what your breathing is doing. For example, is the breath shallow, like the throat or the chest? Or is it medium, maybe down to the diaphragm? Or is the inhale perhaps all the way down to the belly? Just by observing, it often changes just by observing what the breathing's doing. But just notice that pattern as you're focusing on your leg that you just stimulated. What is your breath doing? Maybe the length of your exhale compared to your inhale. You can count as you inhale and exhale, which one's longer as you focus on the sensations in that leg. Okay, so whatever you're noticing, taking a mental note, without stimulating the other leg, I want you to focus awareness on that other leg and notice what your breathing does. Just focus attention on the leg. You can even look at it or put your hands over it so you focus your attention right there on that leg, the other leg. How is your breathing different? Anyone have any differences that they want to call out? Go ahead. 
Yeah, for me, I noticed that on the leg that I stimulated, it was more like deeper breaths and slower. And then when I focused on the right side, it was more like shallow and faster. It's really, I was like, oh, okay, that's interesting. Very cool. Anyone else? Um, I noticed like that I, I yawn a lot because when I'm, my nervous system's trying to sort itself out. And when I was focused on the leg that I'd done the stretching, the yawning was coming easier, which is usually an indication that things are shifting more effectively. And then when I started focusing on the other leg, I was like, oh, I'm like in that place of trying to force the yawn to come because it's not, it's not releasing as easily. So, yeah. So it facilitated the, uh, a sense of ease, you might say, the release when you're yeah. focusing on the thing you stimulated. Yeah. Cool. Anybody else? Yeah. Go. Yeah, I noticed, Amy, um, that you said that um, when you were focusing on your not stimulated leg, um, your breathing was more shallow. When you were focusing on your stimulated leg, your breathing was more, it was easier or something. Um, and I noticed for me that it was the opposite. Like I was actually having trouble breathing and focusing on my breath and my leg at the same time. But with my, like my other leg, I noticed that it's like really numb and that made breathing easier. So yeah, I don't know what that means, <laughs> but. <laughs> One of the things that can at first be frustrating is I, I don't like to say what it means because meaning goes uh, into a neurological pattern that tends to raise the stress response. Whereas when we're just in the body, the stress response goes down. We can talk a little, I mean, the basics of what's going on are wherever you shift your attention, your nervous system responds to that. Let's just leave it at that. So whether it's uh, stimulate, you know, an, a stimulated area that you're focusing on has you breathe more calmly relaxed or more relaxed, or it has you uh, heighten your attention, just pay attention to that because that's learning to feel the shifting of the state of your nervous system and how your body reflects that with sensations and with your breathing. So I have a fun uh, metaphor that I like to use with this process of breathing movement and sensation. Imagine that you're playing a musical instrument, like let's say a violin, right? And as you strum the violin, it's creating a note or a couple notes, depending on how you're playing it, right? And so it's the vibration of the string. Think of that as breathing. So there's a steady flow of breathing, or maybe it, there's not, maybe there are breaks between it, but you know, maybe that's the staccato, right? If you know how to, if you know music where you versus nice long note, right? Um, that's just a different breathing pattern. And so you're stimulating the vibration differently. Notice when you, you know, like you're sitting on an amplifier and the bass is going, right? You feel the, the, the vibration or you're playing an instrument and you feel the vibration of that music. Connect that with breathing. Now imagine that when you move, it's like putting your fingers on the fretboard to change the note. So if you're sitting comfortably and it's easy for you to stand, a great thing to try doing is to notice, okay, what do my thighs feel like right now sitting in the chair? And notice, just notice the breath. You don't have to do anything in particular with it. And as you're breathing, you're gonna to start to move. So you shift your weight forward until you feel the weight goes on your feet. Now, once the weight's completely on your feet, you can lift your butt off the seat a little bit and your legs are active. It's like a different note that you're playing, pressing a different place on the fretboard. Notice what your breathing's doing. Okay, the breathing's interacting with that fretboard of movement and then going back to sitting again. You can even rock forward and back. You don't even have to stand. You can just rock forward and back. So the breathing and movement creates the music of sensation. How do you know you're breathing? How do you know you're moving? You feel it. You sense it. It's not always feeling. Sometimes it's hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's all of the senses. Can't remember the last time I tasted a, a squat, but um, I'm sure it applies at some point. <laughs> uh, okay, so 
If you're ready, we're going to go into one more breathing technique and then take those techniques into movement and focus in on how we can strengthen our core. There's only so much time in the class and we're just going to focus on one area. So we're going to coordinate breathing with the core and we're actually going to sort of blend them together. So the calming breathing pattern that I was mentioning before, there are two basic ways, there are a lot of ways, but there are two basic ways we're going to focus on today. Um, let me give you a view where you can see all of me. Okay. So one hand on the belly and one on the chest. So what you're going to do is use your nose because that's, that's, uh, triggers a more calming response and see what moves when you breathe. Is it your hand on your chest? Is your chest lifting and falling? Or is your belly going out and in, or is it both? Just notice what you feel in your hands as far as the movement of the belly or the chest. So to generalize breathing lower so that your lower hand moves, the one on your belly, like a balloon expanding, you know, imagine your belly's a balloon as you inhale, allowing it to expand, I'll exaggerate it. And then exhale, pull the navel in. It's like you're squeezing the air out from below with your deep core muscles. Inhaling and exhaling. So by breathing low and using the nose, that will trigger a more parasympathetic calming response. So now that we've woken up our system, you feel more, we've been moving, we've been doing a couple stimulating breaths. Now we take that deeper level of awareness because we've come down the curve of, of, of the stress polyvagal curve, right? We're feeling more, we're moving more, blood's pumping a little bit more than it was, maybe not a lot, but this is more of a subtle class than a typical fitness class. And the other part, so we were just talking about two parts that calm the nervous system uh, in terms of breathing. One that we're going to talk about that we just covered is breathing low. As opposed to breathing up here, what happens when you're scared? <gasps> right? You open your upper chest, use your mouth, and <gasps> you expand in your, in your upper lungs. Whereas when you're calm, generally, you're relaxed in your arms and you're breathing down lower. Okay, so that's the first part. The second part that helps you calm your nervous system is to lengthen your exhale. This is really cool side piece of science information I think you'll appreciate. Um, there's this cool little mechanism on the heart, the sinoatrial node of the heart. It's called the vagal break. Yes, like connected to the vagus nerve, right? Whenever you exhale, it puts the vagal break on, slowing down your whole system. It lowers the heart rate, blood pressure, and everything calms. It's, it's an automatic response. So when you're breathing in, it takes the vagal break off and it speeds everything up. So what you get of the speeding up and slowing down of the heart rate is this concept called heart rate variability. You measure your heart rate for a minute, that's an average, but it's actually going up and down. And the more it varies because you have a fairly even amount of time inhaling and exhaling, you have a more balanced system. So Scout, you were talking about earlier, what do I do about my breathing? How do I get into more deep diaphragmatic breathing? One thing we can do is to wake up the system like we just did with the, either Wim Hof breaths, as many as you need, or those are two techniques that work. But once you're aware, once you wake it up, breathe in a calm way where you lengthen your exhale. So a great way to do that is uh, you inhale and count four breaths comfortably deeply into your belly and you don't have to force it, but just count four seconds in. So let's breathe in two, three, four. We're going to lengthen the exhale, exhale one, two, three, four, five, six. Let's inhale one, two, three, four, and let's exhale one, two, three, four, five, six. If you're not synced to this, that's okay. It'll come and exhaling two, Three, four, five, six. Inhale, two, three, four. Exhale, two, three, four, five, six. Inhale, two, three, four. Exhale, two, three, four, five, six. Inhale, two, three, four. Exhale, two, three, four, five, six. Two more. Inhale, two, three, four, exhale, two, 
three, four, five, six. One more. Inhale, two, three, four. Exhale, two, three, four, five, six. Notice what you feel in your body right now. You feel a sense of calm compared to before we did that. You might notice even more sensation. Uh, when we relax, we open up awareness of sensation. So it seems like kind of a paradox at first. We did that stimulating breathing to wake it up, but we don't want to do too much because we want to keep calming the system. So we wake it up with a stimulating breath and then we do deep calming breaths. And this is what we're about to work on. Uh, incorporating that breathing pattern that we'll try and maintain as much as we can through movements, which will tell the body, oh, I'm safe. I can learn new patterns. And we'll break it down into small steps to learn how to do what I call cyclical breathing. Cyclical as in imagining when you inhale that you're cycling your inhale down your front on the inhale and exhaling, sending it up your spine. This is an opening breath. And we're just gonna do this for a couple breaths. So imagine that you're opening your chest as you visualize as if the breath is flowing down the front. Open chest, inhaling, expanding belly, and then belly in as you push that exhale up your spine. Inhale down the front, feel a relaxation opening in the front. And then belly in as you send it up your spine. Inhale down your front, expanding, relaxing the front. And then belly in as you send it up your spine on the exhale. One more, inhaling down the front. Exhaling up your spine. Okay, so that's all we're gonna do of that version of the cyclical breath. I call that the feminine breath. And the reason I call it the feminine breath is it opens things up in your front. It, cre it creates vulnerability, you might say. And it also tends to uh, encourage an arch in your back. Now, what we're gonna do when we exercise mostly is what I call the masculine breath. It's to contain, to create safety, okay? So we're gonna send the inhale down the back this time. And this is what we're gonna continue doing. This is usually what I mean when I say cyclical breath because we don't often do the feminine breath in what we're doing just for the purposes of what we have. As you inhale, you can put your hands on your kidney area and see if you can get it to expand on your inhale. You're sending your breath down your back. And as you exhale, you're going to send the exhale up the front. And the way we do that, you can put your hand on your belly this way. So you have one finger down at the lower belly and then your thumb up near the diaphragm. And you wanna try and make a wave like those, you know, those kids at the swim club, right? <laughs> We're gonna do it one piece at a time. So as you exhale, start by pulling up on your pelvic floor muscles. That's pulling up on your anus as well as the, the deep pelvic floor muscles, like if you're stopping the flow of urine. So that's the beginning of going up the front as you exhale and then pull in your lower belly as you continue and then waving all the way up to the upper belly. And then inhale down the back into your kidneys. And then exhale, pelvic floor up then lower belly, and then upper belly. Inhaling down the back, expanding kidneys. And then what I call zippering up, pelvic floor up, lower belly, upper belly, and a wave. Now this takes some practice to get it down, but what you'll find is this helps what we're just about to do. We're about to actually use your core muscles to tuck the ribs and tuck your tailbone under so that your core muscles connect which lengthens and supports the spine at the mid and low area. And we're gonna do this laying on your back. So if you wanna get into position, um, I'll, I'll change the, the view here so you can see me. Um, and you're welcome to just watch. But we're gonna practice a couple layers of this. This will take about 10 minutes and, and then we'll take questions. So here's my mat. Want to make sure you can see all of me? Okay, great. Okay, so I have one hand on my upper abs and one on my lower abs. And what I want to feel for is that I'm as relaxed as possible. And I'm going to start practicing my cyclical breath, inhaling down my back 
and exhaling up the front, zippering up. The reason I say zipper up is like if you're zippering up a coat, that's the, it's like you're zippering up the front, right? So we're gonna practice relaxing everything we can while breathing in down the back and zippering up the front so the pelvic floor comes up and then that first you know, pinky finger in the lower belly goes in and then all the way up to the thumb. Relax, inhale down the back and zipper up, exhale. Pelvic floor up, lower belly, upper belly in. Inhale down the back and zipper up the front. Inhale down the back, exhale up the front. Okay, so here's where it gets fun. Uh, what we're gonna do is use the breath to encourage the core to connect. So the first part of connecting the core, that is engaging those muscles here in the front, is to tilt the hips. So I flatten my lower back on the ground. So I'm starting to add movement to this breathing so that as I inhale, I'm expanding, feeling the kidneys open up. And as I exhale, I'm gonna start to zipper up like I did before, but I'm also going to tilt my hips this way so that the lower back presses onto the floor and I'll feel my lower abs engage as I pull that lower belly in. So inhale and then exhale, tilt the hips back. So your lower back presses, your tailbone's curling off the ground, but it's hips are still down. It's just rotating. <sighs> inhale down the back and zipper up the front as you tilt your hips. Now, you're welcome to actually do this in your chair. And if you have a backing on your chair, then you can also do that there. You can just feel your hips tilt so that your tailbone uh, tucks under while you're sitting. So as you inhale, you're going down your back. With the inhale, as you exhale, you're tilting your hips. So your tailbone tucks under as you pull the navel in and zipper up, right? Let's do that one or two more times. Cool. So remember when we were working on just the zipper breath, right? The, the cyclical breath where you're zippering up the front. We did both pulling the pelvic floor up and the navel in, but also pulling in all the way up to the upper abs. We're going to connect that now to what it feels like to do a crunch. So this order is inhale down the back. Exhale as you start to zipper up your front, tilt your hips. But you're also, as you pull the belly in all the way here, you're going to tuck your ribs like you're doing a crunch. So you're connecting your upper and lower abs together with that exhale. And inhale, relax. And zipper up. Tilt the hips to flatten your lower back and tuck your ribs. Inhale, relax. Breathing down the back. And zippering up. Tilting the hips and tucking the ribs. One more time. Inhale, down the back. And exhale, zippering up as you tilt the hips and then tuck the ribs. Cool. So we've just connected the pattern of your breathing, sending your exhale up the front as you zipper up while you actually move your skeleton. That is, you're tilting your hips, you're tucking your ribs, and you're getting these two pieces of your core to connect. So in Tai Chi, for example, the most efficient movement to do is the movement that leads from your center. And the less tension you hold in your shoulders, your hips, really all of your limbs, the better the, the movement goes. The more graceful it is, the more ease, flow, power uh, are involved. Because think of it like cracking a whip. If you move from the handle of the whip, and everything else is relaxed. It has a powerful follow through. Same thing with the movement in Tai Chi. We move from the center and the limbs come through like a, a wave going through that. And so in order to do that, we need to let go of that unconscious muscular tension that builds up with stress and trauma, right? So if we're like this, that, that certainly isn't gonna be like a whip-like action with our arm. We're gonna be like, you know, it, it's, it's not gonna go well um, and, it, and it might cause injury. And often that's where we injure ourselves is we are hold, we're holding too much tension. So I'm gonna show you a couple more pieces on that exercise. There are always deeper layers. We're just gonna do one or two more. And 
what I'd like you to feel for is, okay, it's not just what I'm doing in terms of breathing and movement, but what am I tensing that I can let go of? And so what I'm about to take you through is first learning to let go of the tension in the hips and then letting go of the tension in the neck, jaw, shoulders, upper body area. So we're gonna do those things one at a time. It's the same thing we just did. It's the cyclical breath zippering up as you exhale and you're tilting your hips and connecting. But as you do it, notice your glutes. Are they tensing or can you let the tension go? And there are a couple tricks to help you do that. So let's try just a couple times here. You can, again, you can do it sitting with your back up against the back of the chair, but it's probably easier on the floor. So all you're gonna do is the same thing. Inhale down the back, zipper up and tilt the hips so your lower back flattens and tuck the ribs like you're doing a crunch, but see if your glutes are tensing to do that or if you can let them go. Do it a couple times breathing down the back and zippering up. Inhale down the back, relaxing. And exhale, zipper up, tilting the hips so your lower back flattens and tucking the ribs. Let's do it one more time. Breathing down the back and zippering up the front. Okay, one thing you might have noticed if you're, especially if you poke with your fingers, you might even want to try that one or two more times. Feel if the glutes tense up when you tilt your hips. So breathing down the back, poking with your fingers. And as you zipper up and tilt, you feel those muscles tensing up or are they staying loose when you poke them with your thumbs or your fingers, right? So one way to make sure that's happening is to lift your feet just off the ground. Now, if you have lower back issues, don't lift your feet all the way off the ground. You can just keep your toes there. Uh, but if you have no lower back issues, uh, try this without your heels touching the ground at least and see how much more you have to use your abs to tilt your hips. So inhale down the back. And as you exhale and zipper up and flatten that lower back, curling your tailbone under, notice how much your abs are working now that they weren't before. Inhale, relax, breathe down the back. Zipper up and tilt those hips. Without the heels on the ground, you may start to feel, wow, my abs are working a lot harder. You might not have noticed that your glutes were engaging, but once your heels aren't on the ground anymore, they can't help you. And all of a sudden your abs are working harder. And you're like, whoa, I didn't even know I was using my glutes. How did that happen? That's an example of the unconscious muscular tension. It's called tonus, the percentage of tension we hold unconsciously. So we do little tricks like that. Like if my heels aren't on the ground, then when I'm tilting my hips, I'm actually using my abs because I can't really help very much if my heels aren't down. So it's a little bit more difficult when you're doing uh, relaxation in your upper body. because there's not really anything specific you do. You just feel, okay, am I tensing or am I letting them go? So we'll do the same thing, breathing down the back on the inhale and zippering up on the exhale. You're tilting your hips and also tucking your ribs, but notice how much can I tuck my ribs before my shoulders start to do this and tense up? Try not to tense them at all. Let's try both of those things together. So again, breathing down the back. And then as you exhale, tilting the hips as you zipper up here, keeping the glutes free. And as you tuck your ribs at the very end of that exhale, are your shoulders or any of your upper body muscles tensing or can you keep them relaxed? And help down the back as you relax. Zippering up, feeling how you can just use your abs, letting go of your hips and shoulders. You can do this at your own pace. Now, there are so many uses for that uh, zipper breath, the cyclical breath there. Um, whenever you're doing uh, a stretch, for example, it's really hard to tell when there's unconscious muscular tension that you're holding. As a matter of fact, there's always gonna be some level we can't feel. Uh, but if you are connecting your core, it sends a signal to your nervous system that your spine is not in jeopardy. It's supported, your ribs are tucked, your tailbone's tucked under, your lower back is supported with the lower abs and your mid back is supported with your upper abs, especially when you pull that navel in nice and tight. 
Those things, along with the deep relaxed breathing trigger a, a response in your nervous system. Oh, I can relax a little bit more. So you'll get more out of your stretch as a result of breathing that way while you're relaxing whatever you're stretching. So if you're doing the sit and reach for your hamstrings, uh, let's go ahead and try that just so you can get a sense of it. And this is the last one and I'll open it up for questions. So just like we talked about in the beginning, we'll do the, a couple uh, energizing breaths, uh, call them Wim Hof breaths. The, <gasps> as many as you need, maybe it's just one, okay? Maybe it's eight. It's up to you. Feel your body. Notice what it needs. And then on your last exhale, push all the air out and tilt forward until you feel a little stretch here. And you're just going to pump in and out while you're holding your breath. In and out of the stretch. And after you feel that it's activated, it's warm, you're going to relax and use your hands to support on the ground so you can relax those legs completely and just breathe down your back on the inhale and zipper up your front as you relax your hamstrings. Now, if you're too deep in the stretch, your body will fight you and it will get more tense. You wanna make sure you back off after you've uh, energized, activated with the movement and then relaxed you might need to lean back a little bit so your hamstrings don't feel too much tension. They should feel relaxed. And that breath, inhaling down the back and zippering up the front will further signal to your body, oh, I can let go. And one more just for fun, same thing. Notice how far you can tilt forward right now, right? Notice what the angle is, how far you can bend forward. Now do 10 pulse breaths with me. Like you're pushing that air out, belly in, right? Like you're trying to spit across the room. And then go ahead and notice, can I go any further? Isn't that cool? It's a number of things. You stimulated your nervous system to wake up a little bit. And so you activated it with that explosive breath, but you also supported your spine by pulling the navel in. And so it went, oh, I can go a little deeper. I can relax, I can let go. And on a microscopic level, this is a really crude example, but um, the muscle fibers, when they're fully contracted, they're fully together. And these little cross bridges that happen on a microscopic level, they have to actively relax, which is, sounds like an oxymoron, but relaxation is actually an active process. You've got to send the signal for it to relax for those cross bridge heads, heads that are within all those muscle fibers on a microscopic level to let go and actually lengthen. So you need to make sure you're warm when you're stretching, that you're relaxed, even to the point where you imagine yourself on a sunny beach or wherever you're relaxed, it will trigger a different state in your nervous system along with your breathing. And you won't be fighting your own muscle fibers. You'll actually be sending the signal, ah, let go. And even within that, the reason why flexibility is so difficult for so many people to get my improvement on is because there are so many factors going on and, and you, you need to hold it for a long time, get your body used to it. Um, so anyway, I could go on and on about this stuff, but that, those, those are the basics of what I would teach in a class. And now that you know those basics, we can go into more movements next time. Um, and so if you have something specific, like for example, demonstrate something. So there are a lot of ways to get up from laying down or sitting up, but one thing you can learn to do is, okay, so how can I free my hips enough so they're mobile enough to rotate in a way where I don't have to use my hands. I'm using my core strength and I can stand without helping myself with my hands. That would be a whole class waking up the rotators in the hips, activating the core, calming the body, getting each piece of it and building to the end where maybe you couldn't get off the ground without using your hands to help in the beginning of the class, but at the end, you'll be able to. So it's, it's learning a new skill. And because, you know, we have the capacity as adults to do far more than we did when we were infants, um, that took months and months and months to get the muscle tone enough, you know, uh, activation so that we could lift our heads and eventually sit up and, and stand and eventually walk and some of us crawled. Um, I know I didn't. <laughs> I just went right to standing and walking. Um, side note, that seems to be connected to ADD patterns. 
um, if you skip crawling um, because they don't get the cross uh, stimulation of the bilateral sides of the brain. Um, just a theory, but I thought it was interesting. So any questions about what our experience was like or maybe something you experienced that you want to understand more or something you'd like to get out of a future class, you know, uh, man, I'm having neck pain all the time, or why can't I stop my lower back from uh, tensing up in this situation? Uh, anything at all? Yes, Kira, your sound yeah, is on. waving, I gotta go. Oh, okay, see you Kira. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I would actually, I wouldn't mind mentioning some things. For me, it was incredibly hard um, to actually put myself in any of those positions because my lower back and my legs are incredibly weak. A lot of it, um, I had a lot of fight with my brain um, against my muscles. With the breathing, I didn't, it was crossing over from breathing up here to breathing lower and I was cross firing and it wasn't in flow. It was like, which one do I do? because of that fight fight that I'm always in. So that was really hard. So when it came when you were doing the floor work, doing that um, down the spine and up the, up the top and zip it up, um, is there an is there a beginner's way? Because I could not, like I was sitting up because I can't do it on the floor at the moment. But is there a beginner's way to do that, even though that might be considered the beginner's way? Is there like a precursor? <laughs> So I, I did break it down into very small steps um, relative to where we can go, but that certainly wasn't beginner. I, I took you all through a, a fairly advanced sequence of things. There's absolutely a more beginner level to that. I could barely engage my abdomen. That's how weak I am. And I have a combination of health issues. So I'm incredibly weak um, mm -hmm. in health. So I want to be able to uh do these processes but my my brain obviously gets frustrated because i can't sure. see what i'm seeing so that's where i'm just like well what can i start with that will get me there yes like, um baby steps yes so um i have a, a guided meditation on my youtube channel it's called holistic fitness lifestyle and there it's a a guided breathing meditation called core breathing and it takes you through the very basics of, of uh, breathing in that calm way down into your lower lungs using your nose. And you don't have to worry about the zipper. That's, that's a bit more advanced. And I wanted to show you all that so you can see where you're going, but it'll guide you through it. And however you do it is fine. Even the intention of doing it in a particular way will start sending the neural signals for your body to be able to do it later. It has to, there's a learning process. There's definitely a learning curve. Um, so just the basic relax while you breathe in and maybe lengthen your exhale is really all you would need to focus on at first. And then you get that layer and then you could add another thing. Yeah. Cause when you got into like, I felt what you were doing was some of the Pilates moves. There was a lot of Pilates moves with the arch with back and then lowering it back down, um, mm -hmm. as you breathe in, um, or breathe out <laughs> it's backwards for me. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's, that's where I, I lose a lot of engagement and I disconnect. Um, and so, yeah, you're saying if I just concentrate with lowering that breath to the belly and exhaling out, that's the best way to start. And then what's yes. the next step after that? Just so I, can so I, I would say that the very first step with, with uh, practicing that breathing is allowing yourself to feel how deeply you can inhale comfortably. It may not be to your belly. You may still be breathing to, let's say, the diaphragm or maybe slightly into the upper belly. That's okay. Wherever you are is fine. Um, Pretty chilly. Yeah. So one hand on the chest, one on the belly. And what you'll find is as you practice and you send the intention to relax the belly as you inhale, there's a process of letting go of deep tension in your inner costum, costal muscles that they're in between your ribs that may be holding on right now. So just practicing being gentle and slow with, okay, I'm just going to focus on relaxing my lower abdomen and inhale comfortably. Okay. And remember, inhale stimulates the body, whereas exhale calms. So as you do that comfortable inhale, notice how long it takes and then exhale a little longer. Could be even one second longer. And even if your belly isn't expanding actively on your, on your inhale, consciously pull your navel in on the exhale just to give it 
that cue, like, oh, when I exhale, I'm squeezing the air out from below. Can you feel your belly pulling in actively? Even if it's a fraction of an inch. Yeah. Cool. So yeah. And, and, and that's the thing. It, just like um, learning any skill, um, you might start with, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with like BF Skinner and, and behavioral training, like, they, <laughs> but um, so what he did to get the rats to press the, the lever in order to get the pellets and condition them is he gave them approximations and so that he would reward them every time they got close to the lever. And then when they actually touched it, oh, they got a reward there. Um, and so we want to, we, we have an animal capacity of our body, the automatic things that happen without thinking about it. That's the animal level of our nervous system. We want to reward that as much as possible immediately. So when you're feeling like, man, I'm just not getting it, you're experiencing a punishment that's probably going to make it so you don't enjoy the process. So how simple do you need to make it? so that you can experience success. And we, we need to find that and use that over and over again and just go, yeah, I'm, I'm relaxing my belly more after you know three days of trying this. Awesome, that's the step to focus on. And then, oh, I'm actually able to get my exhale a little bit longer than my inhale, one second longer. Maybe eventually you do two seconds longer than your inhale. And the little steps like that and celebrating it, really getting into, you know, just, I, I, I tend to uh, be pretty exuberant about the way I condition myself, but I'm like, yeah, you know, just like little things. And I, my body will respond to that. Your body will too. So it, you can be, you can be playful. It's kind of silly with rewarding yourself. It's like, awesome. You know, even if it seems like it's trite and tiny, teach your body that that's an awesome step. And that it wants to go in that direction by rewarding it. Yeah, great. Thank you for that. Appreciate You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Um, well, for me, I have a lot of spasming in my neck, like muscle spasms. Um, so anything to like release tension, like in like shoulders or neck would be something that I'd be interested in for future um, classes, but also I just want to say like it's been really informative to see all the different pieces of everything that you've learned and are integrating together because I'm familiar with a lot of it separately so it's kind of cool to see how you've like put it all together and use it in a way that supports people's bodies and breathing and stuff. Thank you. So, thank I, you. I, I, I noticed the light bulb go on in your body language a couple different times like <laughs> I know what you're talking about. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's good stuff. Um, so, uh, if you join my Tai Chi class, I actually focus a lot on really releasing the neck and shoulders. Um, and, and I post that every week on my, on my page. Um, I don't know if you've seen that or not. Um, but there's a fair amount of focus on learning to let go of tension there. The marionette string alignment principle is what I call it, um, is very helpful. If you can get your the back of your head, that's directly over your spine, not this part, but this part. It will and 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 make sure it's over the spine, like you're being dangled by a marionette string. That's really helpful for releasing neck tension, long term. You, right away you do it and you try and force it too hard, it might create more. So small, gentle steps and and, and sort of a joke I have with some of my clients where I will say, okay, here are the alignment principles. There's marionette string, shoulders, ribs, tailbone, inner thigh, spiral, space. Relax the shoulders. And I'm moving like a robot because I have, you know, this intention to do it perfectly, right? Um, really small steps are important. So we achieve the goal of less tension. So that's why instead of, um, you know, here and sort of force it in place, it's just, ah, just sort of a, hmm, yeah, can I release tension and get vertical? And then there's this principle in uh, Tai Chi I call shopping cart push because you're imagining pushing a shopping cart filled with heavy rocks, not with your hands on the handlebars, but with your lower abdominals. So you push into that and you're pushing it up a hill. It encourage you, encourages you to keep your hips uh, level as opposed to out here, because you're pushing from here. And the marionette string above that will keep you aligned vertically with your spine. And then those are two basic principles that we'll practice every time in Tai Chi. Um, and that will help tremendously with the neck uh, because when your hips are tilted, it tends to 
bring a forward carriage of the head and shoulders. And now you're not stacked. You're actually holding the weight of your head with these muscles. And over time, you end up with this type of thing going on. Helpful? Yeah, thank you. It's not the first time that I've been, like it's been suggested to take Chai Chi, so I might get to do it. <laughs> okay, cool. Awesome, look forward to seeing you there. Dylan, Scout, anything? Can you, would you um, be open to sending me the, just the, uh, the pictures from, or like the those little diagrams? Yes. At the beginning, are you comfortable? Okay, cool. Yeah, because I didn't retain any of that information, but I want to. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, the the yeah. polyvagal curve, you can get that information. Yeah. I'll send it to you anyway, but just if you want the background research on it and, and, and where it comes from. Um, I it's do. a combination. <laughs> okay, cool. It's a combination between yeah. Steve Gorgeous's polyvagal theory, the, the pocketbook guide. I believe I had it right here so I can show it to you. Is that backward? Or can you see it right? No. Okay, good. Um, so, the pocket book, uh, the pocket guide to the polyvagal theory. Um, Stephen Thank Porges you. is responsible for uh, organizing our understanding of the nervous system uh, with that bell curve that I showed you, so that we understand it's not just sympathetic fight or flight or rest and digest parasympathetic. There are actually two branches of the parasympathetic. Safety is the what's called the ventral vagal, the front part of the, the, the vagal chain um, in the parasympathetic nervous system, and it calms. But the dorsal vagal is connected with a reptilian response. It's that immobilization freeze response. Um, and he was working in a neonatal unit, um, Stephen Porter just doing all this research, and he started to notice the, the babies who were born prematurely, they didn't have a fully developed nervous system. And so they needed to watch out for when their uh, vitals went too low. It was too calm when the parasympathetic was activated. And he thought, well, isn't the parasympathetic supposed to be good? Why is that bad? And he realized there are two separate branches that people have not been differentiating. And they still don't teach it in the schools yet. It's frustrating. Um, but uh, all of the most current trauma-informed work is based on polyvagal theory. Understanding that when we're in a freeze response, that's not calm, but you know, we'll have like, for example, flat affect. You know, as soon as somebody has that type of facial expression, we read it automatically and our bodies respond to it. Like they're not all there. And we actually feel a sort of threat response. Like maybe they're in danger or maybe I'm in danger because they are um, not fully connected to their uh, humanity for lack of a better term. Um, so in trauma informed work, the really big piece about that, and, and, and I'm glad you brought that up, is that understanding the difference between the two parasympathetic branches allows us to work with people in a way where we re-traumatize them. Because if they're in a shutdown state and we don't help them get out of it, for example, where if you're, you know, talking about the frozen tension energy in our body, right? That's a form of the immobilization response that we can't feel and we can't move. We're just not aware of it. But you can read body language cues from people. If, if they walk into the office and their shoulders are like this, you know that that is a immobilized stress response. It's a pattern of posture that they've repeated so often that it's, it's, that's their natural posture now, or at least it feels natural to them. Uh, and so that one cue needs to be worked on in or until they can comfortably without forcing it go, oh, I can actually let go. And there's a whole process involved in that. Um, another example would be meditating when someone is, is has a tendency to dissociate, to space out. Um, I actually could not meditate without uh, dissociating when I first tried it a decade or so ago. Uh, and I learned Tai Chi and I was able to find a way of moving while I calmed my mind. And because I was mobile, I was able to not go into a dissociated state. Now I can meditate without uh, having to move. But I had to go through that process so my body wouldn't go into a re-traumatized state every time I meditated. A lot of people don't realize that if they have residual trauma and they tend to dissociate, don't sit still and close your eyes. Your body will perceive it as I'm immobilized again. I'm back in my trauma. 
and you might not consciously do that, uh, uh, have awareness of that, you might just think, man, I just can't focus. Man, I, I suck at this meditation thing, but our body is going into a freeze response and it's getting worse. So <laughs> keep your eyes open um, if you have any residual trauma um, and if possible, move in a gentle way. And that's a lot of what I teach is learning to move and build the skills so that you have more resilience through competence. You're teaching your body, I'm safe because I'm breathing that way. I'm moving in a more functional way. And my nervous system starts to recognize through the body language I'm practicing, oh, I'm safe, I'm competent. I'm able to protect myself is essentially what we're telling ourselves and the people around us. Um, so that in a nutshell is limbic body therapy. And uh, technically the, my name for this technique that I'm working on that you did a little bit of today is called uh, somatic mindful repatterning integration. So somatic, the body, mindful, you're staying aware and mindful of your senses through the process. Repatterning, we're changing those neurological patterns and integrating it in a way where you have new competence and mastery in, in how you move and feel good about it. You know, like if you learn, you know, a new song, it's like you feel damn good about mastering that song or, you know, and uh, whatever the skill is that you're, that you're working on. Uh, that's why um, the arts are so important in trauma therapy. It's not just, oh, isn't this a fun thing to add? It's critical. Our creative capacity is actually one of the most healing things we can experience. It's pretty cool that we actually have science behind it now. Oh, and the, the other answer to your question, Scout, um, is, uh, let's see, Trauma and Memory is the other book, The, the Layers of uh, Memory. One moment, let me grab that book so you can see it. <laughs> Trauma and Memory, I know it's on the shelf here. Here it is. Okay. by Peter Levine. That's where I got the information about the layers of memory and perception um, and why we focus in on the body. Um, that's another big part of what polyvagal theory helped us to understand is that when we work with the cognitive level of, of healing, like cognitive behavioral therapy, there's not a lot of evidence that it works very well for resolving trauma because cognition is not working very well when you're in a trauma response. Um, and our emotions are not regulated. So even talk therapy, working on the emotions isn't always very helpful either. In fact, it can re-traumatize you because you re-experience that story uh, and your body feels it. So what we need to do is teach the body that it's safe. And so everything that I do, by the way, all, all of the techniques that I teach are about learning competence and calming the body to re-pattern it in a way that feels safe. And, and, and not just feel safe, but you know, it, it lowers the stress response. You could measure. Um, uh, there's this cool device that you can clip to your earlobe on. Uh, it's, it's through a company called Unite, where you measure your heart rate variability. I was talking about before the inhale and exhale, the variation in your heart rate. Uh, and you can actually practice um, watching a, an expanding circle, inhaling, and then exhaling as you see the circle contract. And it teaches you to create more coherence more variability in your heart rate through that patterned breathing. And there's a lot of uh, research behind how supportive that is for resolving um, high stress states, including trauma. So yeah, uh, Scout, I will go ahead and send you both those pictures. <laughs> Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> Actually, uh, anything else? Dylan, you want to chime in at all? No, it's just watching quietly from the background it's kind of okay. too intense for me to try to like do too much but it was good to watch and it was an interesting to see okay cool well thanks for joining us yeah th thanks for doing it absolutely um so I i'm going to be doing this at the same time every week now um this was the first introduction um this one obviously i'm going to be posting on attachment community i, I said i would put the recording there uh but the rest of them will be on my regular page um uh, I don't know if I'm going to be recording them all, but it's going to be going through Aramid, the same, uh, the, the, the wellness center that I teach Tai Chi through. So it'll be an online class at the same time, just a different portal in the future. So thank you very much for joining everybody. And uh, if you have any further questions, feel free to reach out to me on Facebook uh, Messenger, or you can email me at holisticfitnesslifestyle 
gmail.com, uh, excuse me, at gmail.com. Uh, and yeah, have a wonderful night, everybody. Thank cool. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.